I have the pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Christopher Klein. Christopher is the author of When the Irish Invaded Canada, the incredible true story of the Civil War veterans who fought for Ireland's freedom. As the son of Canadian parents, I'm fascinated by the story, Christopher. Another book that Christopher has written is Strong Boy, The Life and Times of John L. Sullivan, America's First Sports Hero. Christopher is a member of the Authors Guild, Biographers International, Boston Authors Club, Irishman, and Irish American Writers and Artists, a member of the Boston Athenaeum, and a graduate of Drew University, where he graduated summa cum laude. Would you please welcome Christopher Klein. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you for coming out uh, today to talk about a story that's going to have a lot of Vermont connections. So my writing has all been in the history area. I write a lot for the History Channel's website. And as Bob mentioned, my last book was a biography of John L. Sullivan, who was the last of the heavyweight bare-knuckled boxing champions. And when it was time to come up with a new book, I had this idea, so I told my agent, I have this great story. It's about a band of Irish immigrants who fled the great hunger, come to the United States, fight on both sides of the Civil War, and then they form their own private army called the Irish Republican Army that undertakes one of the most fantastical missions in military history, which is to hold Canada hostage and ransom it for Ireland's independence. And her first question to me was, when did you decide to start writing fiction? <laughs> So, uh, and then her second question was, well, how many pints of Guinness did it take to come up with this idea? But it's an absolutely true story, it's no blarney, that the Irish invaded Canada not just one time, but five times between 1866 and 1871 in what are known as the Fenian Raid. So it's an idea that sounds absurd to us today, but Hopefully part of what I can do is transport you back about 160 years to see that the idea wasn't as uh, crazy as it sounds today. So, um, uh, so why attack sweet, friendly, polite Canada? A place where even we get into tr uh, the accident with the bus, it will say sorry. Well, part of it is we're viewing the lens of history through today when the United States and Canada share the longest peaceable international boundary in the world, but things between the United States and Canada were not always so polite, and in the first American century, the United States had a border problem. It was a northern one, and the border with Canada was a no man's land that was frequented by counterfeiters and smugglers, and the idea of invading Canada was about as American as fireworks on the 4th of July. So even before the Declaration of Independence is signed, uh, Benedict Arnold leads a band of the Continental Army up through Maine and he meets with another group that was led by General Richard Montgomery straight up through the Lake Champlain Valley uh, to seize Montreal and then there's a battle outside Quebec City on New Year's Eve 1775 that is a rousing defeat for the Continental Army. Then, of course, during the War of 1812, there is uh, constant action going back and forth across the border. Uh, there are battles being fought in Ontario. Canadian, British forces burn down the village of Buffalo. Uh, American forces retaliate to burn down present-day Toronto. And that's all before the British even torched the White House. And then there's a series of ridiculous interactions with equally farcical names like the Pork and Beans War of 1838 between lumberjacks uh, fighting over logging rights in New Brunswick and Maine. There is the Pig War of 1859 that starts when an American on the disputed island of San Juan Island out in the Northwest sees a pig rooting around in his garden and shoots it dead. The pig was the property of the Hudson's Bay Company uh, let's just say that things spiraled out of control to the point that 2,000 British troops and five warships were sent to the island along with 500 American troops. 
that have a standoff basically just watching each other for months on end on this island. So there's this long history of, of attacks there. And the other thing to remember about this time period when the Irish are invading Canada in the 1860s is that the flag that's flying over Canada is not the maple leaf that we're all familiar with, but it's this flag, the Union Jack, which um, is a hated symbol for many of the Irish who are engaged in these attacks. And if you were going to use today's parlance, you'd say that they were radicalized by their experience living under the British. So the luck of the Irish was not anything that you really wanted to have for about 700 years of world history because the Irish had the poor fortune of being in the backyard of the British who colonized their island. Uh, things are particularly bad during the 1700s when the British enact what are called the penal laws. And if you were an Irish Catholic living in Ireland, you could not freely worship, you could not own a horse that was worth more than five pounds, you could not send a calf, your um, a child to a Catholic teacher, you could not have a Catholic teacher come in to teach your child, you couldn't own a firearm, you were, you were allowed to have a knife, but only if it was chained to a table in the kitchen so that you could not use it against the local police. And then even in death, your rights were restricted because a Catholic priest could not preside over a graveside ceremony in, in a cemetery. So for centuries, there's a segment of the Irish who think that the British are trying to exterminate their culture, their language, their religion. And then when the potato crop uh, starts to fail in the 1840s, there's a segment of the most militant Irish who think that the British are trying to exterminate them altogether because even as the potato crop is failing, there's still crops such as wheat, oats, and barley that are being grown in Ireland but are being shipped under guard to cities in England. So during this great hunger when the potato crop uh, fails, there are one million Irish who die, two million are forced to flee the country, so it goes from an island of eight million people to a little bit less than five million people and still not ever come back to where that population was beforehand. And about nearly a million Irish are going to come to the United States. And when they come to the United States, they, they encounter a backlash uh, in the 1850s from, from the nativists. And the Irish are going to survive like they always survived in, in England and that, or in Ireland, and that was to cling together, coil inward. So they cling together in church parishes, fraternal organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And then in 1858, there's a new organization that begins in the United States that's called the Fenian Brotherhood. And the Fenian Brotherhood was established in the United States as a sister organization to a group called the Irish Republican Brotherhood that was established in Ireland. And this was a transatlantic revolutionary organization. So the idea is that in Ireland, the IRB is going to gather the men to put together an army to launch a revolution inside Ireland. With the freedoms that America provided, the Irish immigrants are going to raise money and purchase weapons that they're going to send across the ocean to Ireland to launch the next revolution. So, What's really amazing is that you have these exiles from Ireland who even after being in the United States for 20 years, even after fighting in the Civil War, and there's nearly 200,000 Irish who fight in the Civil War, that they still viewed themselves as Irish first and American second, and that's how they would refer to themselves in their writings. And even uh, uh, generals inside the Civil War after fighting for the Union cause, a man named Thomas William Sweeney uh, leaves his, the service of the Union Army to become this, the Secretary of War of the Fenian Brotherhood, because many Irish thought their service in the Civil War was a training for the fight that they really wanted to have, which was going to be against the British. So this idea of having the uh, attack in Ireland is underway until 1866, and then the British crack down in Ireland. And it's at the same point that there's a rise of this interest in uh, a group inside the Fenian Brotherhood to invade Canada. And in 1866, the organization is really at its height. So there's tens of thousands of members of the Fenian Brotherhood, has its own president, 
has its own constitution, has its own capital building right in the heart of New York City, which was called the Moffat Mansion on the north side of Union Square. And inside this brownstone is where the Secretary of War would plot the invasion against Canada. The other thing that the Fenian Brotherhood did was they sold these bonds in denominations between $10 and $500. So these were war bonds to fund the war effort for the freedom of Ireland. And these bonds were going to be payable six months after the establishment of the Irish Republic. Now there's an interesting footnote that when the Irish Republic is actually established in the 1920s, all of a sudden these bonds come out of the drawers that people had squirreled them away in the United States looking for them to pay out in Dublin. They had no idea what these, these bonds were. They didn't pay them off. But um, they could still fetch you a pretty penny these days on, on eBay. So why attack Canada? Well, the idea is that maybe what they can do is divert some British troops from Ireland to Canada, make it more um, receptive to a, a revolution in Ireland. Another idea is that if they get a bit of land in Canada, they will be recognized as belligerents by the United States government and be able to launch privateers to disrupt British shipping out on the ocean. Um, Probably the best idea is that what they can do is actually spark a war between the United States and Great Britain. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And at the end of it, if the Irish help the, uh, the United States sees Canada as its own, that the United States in return will give Ireland back to the Irish people. And then there's a real militant group that thinks that they're simply going to conquer all of Canada. All the Irish in Canada, which are their tens of thousands, will rise up to help them and they'll just simply hold it hostage, and then we're going to ransom it from the British government for Ireland's independence. And the most surprising thing to me in doing this research is that this idea has the tacit approval of the White House, even though it's contrary to American law. And that is because of, there's so much animosity towards Great Britain and Canada at the end of the Civil War. So the anger towards Canada, because that's where a cell of the Confederate Secret Service was able to operate freely. Uh, it's thought that that uh, cell was involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and then also, of course, was involved in the raid in, on St. Albans, Vermont in 1864. And anger towards Great Britain because warships like the CSS Alabama that did tremendous damage to Union shipping um, were built in British ports. British guns were used by the Confederacy. So at the end of the Civil War, the United States wants millions of dollars in reparations from Great Britain. So the Fenian Brotherhood is a way for them to leverage the British government to pay out this money. So that's why President Johnson, in a meeting with the Fenians, who tell them about their plan to attack Canada, supposedly tells them that he's more or less going to turn a blind eye to whatever they're going to manage to do. So their first major attack is in uh, on June 1st, 1866. So there's a plan of a five-pronged amphibious invasion of Canada being launched from Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Buffalo, and then up through the Lake Champlain Valley to seize Montreal, and then Quebec and have a chokehold on the St. Lawrence River. So the one thing, even though the Fenian Brotherhood was uh, supposedly a secret society, the one thing it could never do was keep a secret. So it's front page news when they start to mobilize to have this attack on Canada. And the plan starts to fall apart. The best they can do is they get about 800 men in Buffalo, New York. And the decision is made is, all right, even though we're expecting to have uh, an army of about 20,000, let's just launch this invasion, get across the river, and as soon as we do, all the Irish in America are going to come right behind the army all the Irish in Canada are going to rise up, and all the French in Canada are going to rise up too because they expect that they're going to want to kick the British out as well. So the, when the invasion is launched, it's led by this man who is John O'Neill. And John O'Neill was a native of uh, County Monaghan in Ireland. He was raised more or less by his grandfather who told him great tales of members of the O'Neill clan such as um, Hugh O'Neill and Owen Rowe O'Neill, who became famous because they dared to fight against the English, even though they never gained Ireland's independence. Just by choosing to fight, you're going to be a famous figure in Irish history. 
And then when the great hunger struck, he saw what it did to his family farm. He saw his town's population decline by 20%. And ultimately, he's forced to flee to the United States as well. He will fight in the Civil War, um, sustain an injury during the Peninsular Campaign. And then after the war, he joins the Fenian Brotherhood when he learns of this plan to attack Canada. And so he's given the command to lead the army across the Niagara River uh, on June 1st, 1866. And to John O'Neill, he's living out his dream because he had written that he, um, you know, his one purpose in life, apart from his duty to his God, was to be at the head of an Irish army fighting against England for England's rights. And to him, Canada is a completely legitimate target because it's under um, its British soil. So the next day, June 2nd, there is a big battle about 20 miles south of Niagara Falls called the Battle of Ridgeway. And John O'Neill's army is a mixture of Union veterans and Confederate veterans. So he's got men who are wearing Union blues. He's got men wearing Confederate grays. Some have come as far away as New Orleans. Most of them are um, natives of Ireland who had a flee during the Great Hunger. And the Canadian Defense Forces, even though they're three times uh, the size in terms of number are much more inexperienced. In fact, one of the battalions is composed of students from the University of Toronto who got a knock on the door the night before the battle saying, good news, you don't have to study for your finals anymore. Bad news is you need to be at the drill shed in downtown Toronto at 5 a.m. tomorrow where you're going to be given a gun and going off to the war front to fight the invaders crossing the southern border. So with his more experienced forces, uh, O'Neill is able to win the day. There are about 20 men on both sides who, are, um, who die in this battle. Uh, there's another firefight through the streets of Fort Erie later that afternoon that O'Neill is going to win as well. But he then sees that his supply lines have been cut off and he thinks he's been double crossed by the United States government. He's got no other choice but he needs to retreat back to American soil. Uh, before he leaves, he lines up all the Canadian prisoners that the Irishmen have taken, who think that they're about ready to get to be um, killed by a firing squad. But instead, John O'Neill goes down the line one by one, shakes each man's hands, and then pledges he's going to return to Canada with a much bigger army. And he is going to be a man of his word, as we will see. So John O'Neill, um, after the Battle of Ridgeway, um, is... Uh, He's, no, we don't have the newest one. So, uh, so John O'Neill leaves Battle of Ridgeway. Days later, there's um, hundreds of Irishmen uh, who have amassed up in St. Albans, Vermont, to launch the main attack here. And uh, the Canadians are fearful after hearing about the Battle of Ridgeway. They pull back all their defense forces 15 miles from the border. And the Irishmen find an undefended border. They cross right uh, across from Franklin, Vermont, into Quebec. They make camp about 500 yards into Canadian territory and start to declare the Irish Republic in exile there, which they will control for two days. Uh, they will uh, start uh, looting all the farms that are left unintended there. They don't have any food, so they have to forage all the food for themselves. Uh, they will find, uh, they will go to a custom house, tear down a Union Jack, which they will bring back to America. And for two days, uh, they are in control of this area of Canada before Canadian Defense Forces finally arrive, uh, kick them out after a little bit of gunfire uh, back to the United States. And the only thing they have to show for it is this one British flag that they have from the, from the custom house. So as I said, John O'Neill is going to be a man that's true to his word. So. He becomes probably the most famous Irish American of his day. He's known as the hero of Ridgeway. He is feted all over the country. And then he will become president of the Fenian Brotherhood and never let go of this idea of attacking Canada. So he's ready to strike again in 1870. So he puts together another invasion plan. He secretly uh, has weapons smuggled up to the Canadian border in uh, farms along the uh, end of Vermont countryside outside of St. Albans. And then he launches another invasion on May 25th, 1870. And incredibly, he does the invasion on the same exact road from Franklin, Vermont into Canada that his men had tried four years earlier. 
And so they cross the field of a dairy farmer named Alva Richard, who might be my favorite character in the book. So poor Alva Richard has now seen twice in four years, he's got an Irish army uh, looking to attack British interests traipsing through his dairy farm to turn it into a battlefield. And O'Neill asks if he can go up into Alva Richard's house, but Alva Richard doesn't want anyone tramping dirt into his house, and he doesn't want any dirty boots on the quilts that his grandma has made, so he refuses them entry into, it, into his house. So the attack starts um, May 25th, 1870, and the road is defended by this hillside, Eccles Hill, and up on Eccles Hill is a couple dozen Canadians who formed their own home guard after the last invasion, because they didn't think that uh, provincial defense forces, British were not doing anything to de defend their property, so they formed their own private home guard, which they called the Red Sashes, and they would drill uh, every week, even in the winter time, and you know, they were mocked by a lot of locals who think that the Irish are never going to come back. Why are you going through all this? But then, sure enough, they're ready. They're up on this hill when the Irish cross over in, um, in May 25th, 1870, and the Irish have a numerical advantage about six to one against the men who are up on this hill. So O'Neill gives the signal for the men to cross the line. And one of the first men to cross is a 25-year-old firefighter from Burlington, Irish immigrant named John Rowe. Uh, John Rowe gets about 30 yards over the border to there's a bridge over uh, what's called Chickabitty. Uh, Creek. And from up on the hill, one of the home guards who had his house ransacked by the Irish four years earlier is watching John Rowe through his sight on his rifle. As soon as he crosses over this bridge, he fires it off, strikes John Rowe dead on the bridge there. Uh, the Irish then just scatter. They duck under the bridge, they go behind uh, Alva Richard's uh, chicken coop into his barns, and then they storm into Alva Richard's house, tracking, sure enough, all the dirt into the house that he didn't want to have uh, in there. And um, also going into the house then is John O'Neill, who sneaks up to Alva Richard's attic to watch what's going on um, in the battlefield. And uh, so Alva Richard's trying to get all these Irishman out of his house, and then he can hear what's going up on the attic, in the attic, and he sees John O'Neill forcibly just throws him out of his house. And John O'Neill then is outside the house and is trying to rally his men uh, for another attack. Starts calling them cowards, which is not, I don't think, the best motivational uh, tactic. Um, so he, he's trying to rally his men to, to regain order, get across the line, and um, then all of a sudden he feels a hand on his shoulder and it's a United States Marshal who tells him that he's under arrest. And basically throws John O'Neill into a carriage and whisks him back to St. Albans. So there are a few things I don't, that could be probably as humiliating for a battlefield commander as to be arrested by your own government on the battlefield and then taken away. So the Irishmen don't have their commander anymore. And uh, basically, they just wait till nighttime, cover darkness, to uh, retreat out of Alva Richard's farm back to Franklin, Vermont. And uh, O'Neill is then sent to a prison for violating American neutrality laws. Now, this is uh, an illustration that appeared in, I think, Frank Leslie's uh, newspaper in America. I'll show you how the Canadians depicted this. A little bit differently in their depiction of John O'Neill here. So you can sort of see these nativists, that, you know, and it's not uncommon to have seen Irishmen depicted like this um, by nativists in North America as sort of part leprechaun, part gorilla, um, with these simian, fig, uh, simian features. He's got a, um, you can't really see it, but he's also got the jug of liquor at his feet, which is always present. And um, that is the end of the Battle of Eccles Hill in 1870. Uh, the Irishmen actually had a field piece, uh, a, a cannon that they, that they were able to fire off, but to no effect. 
Asa Westover in his red sashes sees this cannon and it's still on top of Eccles Hill today uh, next to a monument that's up there as well to this defense of Canada. Now, one interesting thing about the army that day in 1870 was they called themselves the Irish Republican Army. And John O'Neill made sure that they were suited as opposed to four years earlier when they had a, just a mishmash of uniforms. They went in with green uniforms on them and they had buttons and engraved on the buttons, they said IRA. Now, it became a joke in Canada that because they went to such a frantic retreat at the Battle of Eccles Hill that they joked that IRA stood for I ran away. <laughs> so that's the end of this engagement in 1870. O'Neill um, stands trial in Vermont. He's sentenced to prison and is put in the Windsor State Prison. And he is released finally because he is pardoned by President Ulysses S. Grant under the one condition that he will never again try to attack Canada. Now, John O'Neill may have believed it at the time, but he said, I will never attack Canada ever again. Um, I don't think he believed it, though, because uh, he would never let go of this idea. So um, he tries again in 1871 to attack Canada. This time, uh, he goes out west and gets about three dozen Irishmen from St. Paul, Minnesota, and they try to launch an attack from uh, North Dakota into Manitoba. Uh, let's just say this wasn't the most well thought out attack because John O'Neill seizes a Hudson's Bay Company and a Canadian Customs House, and then he is again arrested hours later by United States troops, and he can't figure what American troops are doing in Canada. Well, John O'Neill did not know that the border had been recently resurveyed those buildings that used to be a quarter mile north of the border inside Canada were now three quarters of a mile south in the United States territory. So John O'Neill could not get even arrested really for invading Canada because he never actually left the United States territory <laughs> at the entire time. So, so what's the legacy of, of the Fenians? Well, uh, I w and I'll give you the spoiler alert, the idea of holding Canada hostage and ransoming it for Ireland's independence did not work. So I, I will lay the cards on the table. But um, in one sense, they do bring self-government to an area of the British Empire, just not the one they intended, Canada. Canada will become uh, its own federal country in 1867 in reaction to the Battle of Ridgeway. And it's driven in large part by concerns among Canadians that the British government is not doing a good enough job in terms of protecting its southern border. Then this transatlantic partnership that's made to have guns and money raised in America to support a revolution in Ireland is one that will be put to use in 1916 with the Easter Rising and the Ireland's eventual liberation. And the role of American Irish, the Irish and American cannot be understated in terms of this, the eventual success of that revolution 60 years after um, the attempted invasions of Canada. And then finally, I think it's just, you know, you, you'll read a lot of books, see a lot of movies about people who face overwhelming odds, and there's almost always the storybook ending, the Hollywood ending, that they somehow managed to overcome those overwhelming odds. But I think the story of the Fenians is sort of a reminder that a lot of times you face overwhelming odds, and you know what, the odds win and you are not going to be successful, but that doesn't mean that you don't put up a fight because just because you might not be successful in your lifetime doesn't mean that a future generation might not. And so whether it's a fight for civil rights, a fight against cancer, in this case, a fight for Ireland's independence, um, the Fenians were able to keep this torture revolution alive from previous generations, hand it off to one that was ultimately successful to see success in their lifetime. So if it weren't for these Fenians, that, that torture freedom might have burned out before Ireland ever saw its success, um, its freedom and independence decades down the lines. So.